Excellent. And here again, we're given an unsorted list. It's a divide. It's a recursive uh, algorithm. So, step one. Well, of course, if if the size of L is equal to uh, one or two, some trivial base case, you're done. You return. Otherwise, you just pick what's called a pivot element. Say x, and you uh, find the elements. Let's put in a list L1 that are strictly less than x. Again, for simplicity, let's assume that the elements are all distinct. You won't have to worry about ties that way. Um, Find the elements L2 that are greater than x. And then you quick sort L1. That's a recursive call. And those guys were less. x is going to be there. You quick sort L2. And then you return that result. Okay? Quick sort. Actually works very well in practice. A lot of practical sorting methods are quick sort or some embellishment, some refinement of quick sort. So what's the worst case running time of this method? It's it's what? Right. Okay. So, but and, and what's the what's the running time ultimately? <coughs> n squared. Okay. So n squared could happen. I mean, what happens if you're unlucky is x is picked at one extreme or the other of the data and doesn't end up splitting very much. All you learned was, well, x is somewhere, and let's say one of those is empty. This 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 might be empty. In which case, you reduce down to a, a size problem which is only one smaller than it was previously. Okay. And in this here, when we're finding the elements that are larger or less than x, that's a, that, that's a lot of comparisons. That's comparisons which is, a, which is equal to the size of those sets. Okay? So when, when bad things happen to good people, or whatever, it's, uh, this is the recursion. Okay, bad things happen to good algorithms. This is it. Okay? Uh, what am I doing? Plus n. All right? And what does this solve to? n squared. This is n plus n minus 1. And this, uh, T of n is equal to summation, like, roughly like this, of i, which is roughly like n squared. Okay. So that's the worst case analysis of quicksort. Now, there is um, an average case analysis of quicksort which really is averaging over some choice of the input. We're saying, let's, let's think about a random data in some random permutation. And that's going to be our source of, of uh, an average over that. But we're not going to do that kind of analysis. I think the book actually does it. But um, we won't. What we're going to do instead is randomize over our selection of the pivot. X. So we have a set given to us, and it's usually given in some, well, it doesn't matter how it's represented. But the choice of X is going to be uniformly selected from that set. And that's important. If I, if I had an algorithm where I said X is always, the pivot element is always going to be the first element in however that set was represented. If I specified the algorithm down to that level of detail, then it's trivial for an adversary, remember adversaries, to force 
um, an n squared time behavior. If the adversary knows exactly, oh, I, I have to throw in a little digression here. Remember five minutes ago when I said we have these lower bounds that are embarrassingly below? I'm talking about lower bounds on problems, okay? When, you, when I specify a specific algorithm, we very often have lower bounds on its behavior that are quite tight, okay? So in this quick sort case, if the algorithm is specified down to the point where I'm saying exactly how the pivot is going to be selected from the set, then it's very simple to come up with an adversary that forces that specific algorithm to take n squared, roughly n squared time. So the randomization that we're talking about here is on what element gets selected as the pivot. But isn't that just a normal quick sort? I mean, normally, how is it that you always choose the same element? The question is, isn't, isn't randomizing the normal way to do quick sort? Well, I don't know what the normal way is or not. The simplest way to program quick sort is you know, when you're given a list, you pick the first element as your pivot. And if you've specified that level of detail, the adversary can defeat you, okay? Now, maybe the normal way, everybody's smart enough now, or they know this stuff, that they know not to do that. Maybe the normal way is to randomize, but we're doing analysis of it, okay? Okay, so what, what we'll prove here is that with that little bit of randomization, we'll defeat all adversaries, okay? Um, well, not in worst case, but in the, in the sense that we're going to prove here, in the probabilistic sense. Okay, so is it clear what, what the randomized algorithm is? Pick a, a pivot element x, and it's going to be randomly, that means uniformly, from the set L. And then everything else is the same. Okay, all the other details of randomized quick sort are the same. But what I'm pointing out is the source of randomization is inside the algorithm. We're going to do our analysis for any input, no matter how degenerate that, that input happens to be, no matter how, how clever some adversary tries to be. What we're going to prove is going to be true for any input where the source of randomization is, is in the selection of x, okay? And that selection of x is, is, uh, is unrelated to the data. It's just being selected uniformly from among a, a set of elements. Okay. Um, so here's what we want. We want to establish the expected number of comparisons. Oh, number of comparisons is a random variable because there's a randomization in this, there's a random element to this algorithm. Okay? Hopefully everybody's comfortable with basic notions of probability. You know what a random variable is. The point is, even for some fixed data, you take this, the same data, you run the algorithm once, there's some number of comparisons. You run it again, it could be a different number of comparisons. You run it a third time, it could be a, a different number. Of, so the number of comparisons that happen in that execution that's a random variable. And this is for a fixed input of length n. I'll let you fix the input. Let the adversary fix the input. We're not randomizing over, over differences in the input. We're just randomizing over selection of x, and therefore the expected number uh, here is a, is, a, uh, is a random variable. Um, okay, and so this is what we want to examine. I mean, you also would like to know the variance. You'd like to know something about this distribution, this random variable. But the first thing is the expectation. Yeah? Sorry, say this again? The worst case doesn't change given the expected. Right, right, right. The worst case doesn't change because whatever data, that data is fixed, okay? So the adversary certainly can come up with choices of x 
throughout the entire execution of the algorithm which make it do n squared comparisons. The issue is what's the probability that those particular choices of x would come up when you're randomizing. And you would expect that that probability is quite low. I mean, if we're going to show the expectation, let's say it was n log n, then you would, you would expect that the probability of those, those really degenerate cases is going to be very low. We could get into that too, but the analysis we're going to do is just going to give us the expectation. But certainly the degenerate cases are still possible. There's non-zero probability of those happening, and therefore the worst case hasn't changed. Okay, let me, we need some definitions. SI, and I don't know why. Well, I guess I do know why. Anyway, notice that there are parentheses here around the I is the ith smallest element in set S. OK. So I'm paying a penalty now for not having looked at my notes uh, when I started here. Over here, the list was L. It just became S. All right? So, or set S. So S is the, uh, the data. This is a particular element. It's not the element in the ith position of the representation of S. It's the ith smallest one okay, in the entire set. And then I want this, def this random variable xij equals 1 if and only if the element si is compared to sj in an execution of the algorithm. So once you, once you have a specific execution of the algorithm, you know what the value is for each of these xij's. Either the ith smallest element was compared to the jth smallest element, or it wasn't. Okay, where are the comparisons actually being done? Comparisons are being done when you have a pivot element and other elements of a set are being compared to it. Okay? So it has to be, if, if the ith smallest element is compared to the jth smallest element, one of these two had to have been a pivot element at that moment when the comparison happens. Okay? That's the only way two elements are compared uh, in quicksort. And so what we want, this is i, and this is j greater than i, xij, this is the total, this is the total number of comparisons that are made in a particular execution. Right? So total number of compares in an execution. is this thing. So what we're interested in is the expected value of that. Because again, this xij is a random variable. In some executions, xij was, it gets to be 1. In some executions, it's get to be, it gets to be 0. So it's 1 if and only if that. Oh, and I didn't tell you what it, it is. When it's not 1, it's 0 otherwise, which is what you would expect. OK, we want the expectation of this summation. What's the, first, what's the most obvious thing you should do with this? Yeah, expectation, um, what's the right way of saying this? Um, is linear, expectations add. OK, so this is the expected value of xij.
it doesn't matter what horrible dependence there is between these random variables x. I mean, the algorithm is complex. Therefore, these, you know, who knows what kind of dependence there is between them. It doesn't matter. When you're computing expectations of a sum, that's the sum of the expectations. Okay. A neat, very useful fact about expectations. And what is the expectation of, well, this is just terminology. Another definition. The probability that SI is compared to SJ, that's going to be denoted as PIJ. Okay. Just terminology. Okay? So we're running this algorithm over and over and over again. And at least if you think of probabilities in a frequency sense, sometimes the ith element is compared to the jth element, and sometimes it isn't. And if you do this long enough, the, the percentage of times, sorry, the frequency in which i and j are, si and sj are actually compared to each other, that's your pij. Or if you want to think of it more abstract, there is some probability, very complicated to figure out perhaps, but some probability that si will be compared to sj. Okay? But with this notation, what is this thing? Well, I mean, the expected value of xi. What's the expected value of xi? Uh, sorry, xij. Yeah. Would it be the um, <clears throat> um, probability that either value i or value j is chosen as the pivot? Not quite. And, and then I, we're going to get onto that. We're going to connect, of course, these things to pivots. But right now, I'm just talking about notation. OK, this is just formal notation. What's the expected value of a random variable? You, you enumerate over all of its possible values, which in this case is just 1 and 0. And for each possible value, you have to multiply by its probability, and then you sum those up. So this is 1 times pij plus 0 times 1 minus pij, and that equals pij. So the expected value of this random variable is just pij. We haven't done anything. I mean, this is all just symbol manipulation at this point. There's almost no content here yet. This was our only content, really, was moving it in here. But it, it, it's forming the problem. So this is, I apologize for how the board work is going. Let me just simplify this one as pij. i and j greater than i, and this is pij. Well, this is the, the key thing. If we can figure out something about this sum, we have the expected number of, of comparisons. All right? So if we can figure out this sum, we're, we're done. And now comes the content, because we're going to start making some observations about what pij is. OK, what is pij? Or what, what can we say? I mean, this could be really complicated. I mean, we're talking about, does the ith smallest element get compared to the jth smallest element in an execution of this, this algorithm? And surely that has to depend on what i and j is, I mean, or what all the other data is, or I don't know. It's complicated. How many elements are there? N. N elements. Is that restriction on the second sum trivial? Or, I mean, what, where did that come from? I mean, it may, you're saying it's obvious that once you compare I and J, you're not going to compare J back with I? But is, that, is that all that is? I mean, why is there a restriction on the sum? What do you mean the restriction? This one? For well, the fact that I've got this i over all possible 
1 through n is implicit. And this is j greater. I just, I just want this ij to be there enumerated once in the sum. I don't want it to be enumerated twice. Then I would get t twice the expectation. I'm interested in, in this. I just want each ij pair to show up once in this summation. I don't want it to show up twice. Okay. That would be overcounting. Oh, that is a mistake. Question is, does it matter? Uh, I think it's going to be the same, but I didn't intend it. I was not trying to be tricky, but um, if you like, make these the same. Okay. The only point of this is to make this um, each ij pair is there exactly once. Okay. All right, what can we say about pij? Now this is, as I say, pij looks like it's really complicated. How are we ever going to get our hands on it? And well, we won't exactly, but you can, you can say something about it. And the, the best way to um, to understand this analysis is to draw a picture of what's happening in the algorithm. So what's happening in the algorithm is you, you pick a pivot. Uh, initially, we have, we have the entire set S. Pick a pivot, X. And that partitions the elements into S1 and S2. And now uh, I'm following the notation of the, of the notes that you'll get. And now you can see why they put parentheses around this. This is a set now and not an element. Okay? The element S was denoted S with parentheses. I didn't invent this notation, but I should follow uh, what's, in, what's in the notes. So um, let me just ask um, a question. If the pivot X is SI, Okay, remember, we're, we're, looking, we're trying to compute pij. We have two particular elements in mind, the ith smallest and the jth smallest. If x is either si or sj, what is xij? One. One. OK, so if, if we have an execution where this pivot at the very start was one of our two elements of interest, then of course si is going to be compared with sj. Second question, what if this element x is strictly between si and sj? Then what's the value of xij? It's going to be 0. If at the very top you pick a pivot which is strictly between these two guys, then si is put down here. Sj is put over here, and there's no opportunity for them to be compared anymore because quicksort just continues to refine the two sides. Hmm? No, I mean x. This is the, this is the pivot element. That's the little. That's the little pivot element that we had over in the. Uh, in the algorithm. If at the very beginning we pick a pivot element that splits SI and SJ into two sets, they're never going to be compared. Okay? Um, then, S, then XIJ, this implies XIJ equals zero. If if SI or SJ equals that little x, that implies that XIJ equals 1. And what happens if SI and SJ are both less than x? Then 
that we don't know yet. I'm only looking at the first pivot choice. Okay. If if uh, both elements are put on the same side, and we just don't know yet what x i j is, and similarly this way. So for those cases, we don't know. Okay. Yeah. A little x. Equal little s. What, where's a little s? Little x. Yeah. Number. Right. Okay. If one of our two intended victims is equal to little x, it's used as a pivot. At the top of this algorithm, all other numbers are being compared to the pivot, and so of course the other element will be compared to it. OK? All right. Well, so everything is settled in these two cases. But if this is alive, if this happened, then let's say SI, make this bigger, S little i and S little j are both over here. And again, we pick a pivot and we split. And again, the analysis is the same. If the pivot we picked was one of these two guys, then definitely SI will be compared to SJ. If the pivot we picked is strictly between the two, then definitely these guys will never be compared. And if the pivot we picked is on one side of, or the other of both of them, then we still don't know. All right? So. The same logic continues all the way down. So let me go from that logic. We still have that thing. Let me go from that logic to the statement. The following lemma. Consider the subset. SI, SI plus 1. Oh, I guess Im implicit in all of what I'm doing here, I'm cons considering I to be less than J. So SI is the ith smallest element. It's smaller than the jth smallest. <coughs> SI, SI plus 1, all the way up through SJ minus 1, and then SJ. So think of all the elements in the input set between the i-th smallest and the j-th smallest. What happens to them in the algorithm is that they stay together on one side or the other until a pivot is picked, which uh, is from among this set. Okay? Initially, th this subset is in a bigger set. And even after the first x is picked, it might still be in a bigger subset. Okay, and it's going to stay together in one side or the in one set until a pivot is picked, which is inside this set. So this subset stays together in the algorithm until some pivot uh, in the range SI to SJ is picked. So if you follow the history of the algorithm, here you, here you have SI through SJ. <coughs> Definitely, it's together in this some subset, in this set, full set S. Then let's say it was not split, so it goes over here. And let's say again, it was not split, it goes over here. And it was not split, it goes over here. Until finally, there's some moment when a, when a pivot is picked that splits it. 
So looking down this path where the subset went, we know a first moment in time. That's a, that's a well-defined concept. A first moment in time when some element inside that interval is picked and then it splits those guys. And here's the punchline. At that moment, there is some moment, and it happens, because ultimately everything is split into individual elements. There is some moment. When you, when you follow SI through SJ down its history, there is some moment when it's split. Okay? At that moment, the pivot element is either SI or SJ or something strictly in the middle. If it's SI or SJ, then I and J get compared. SI and SJ get compared. If it's something strictly in the middle, then they don't. Okay? So at the moment, um, a pivot is picked, or at the, you know, the point in the algorithm is picked in the interval SI through SJ, it is one of SI or SJ with what probability? Yeah, you have two choices out of the entire side out of all the elements that are there. Okay? So there is some moment in time. Any execution has some moment in time when this interval gets split. And at that moment, when it gets split, it's split either because you picked a pivot that was one of these two elements or you didn't. So what's PIJ? This is it. This is subtle, I think, to, to really convince yourself that this is the probability that element i will get compared to element j. All right? In every execution of the algorithm, there is a moment in which this interval gets split. Whatever happened before that is absolutely irrelevant. Whatever happens after that is irrelevant to the question of what PIJ is. At the moment that it gets split, we've picked a, a, a pivot element uniformly in that set, which also means with respect to the interval, it's uniform inside there. So in a sense, conditioning on the, on the fact that we are picking a splitting element, it's going to be one of these two endpoints with this probability. And that's exactly the probability that um, we have an execution of the algorithm where element SI is compared with element SJ. It's subtle because there's all this other stuff flying around in the algorithm and all this other stuff going on. And you first you feel like you should condition on all the previous choices that happened. Okay. So this is the most subtle point. And now we get our answer, because what's the summation of PIJ? So the expectation we were looking for, the expected number of compares <coughs> equals summation i equals 1 through n, j greater than i, 2 over j minus i plus 1. Well, this is all just arithmetic from this point on. And I, maybe next time I will try to do some more of this arithmetic. It will be in your notes. But um, this thing turns out to be uh, n log n. Okay, so th this, this particular analysis of this sum we will do. We only have two minutes left, and I want to hand out the homeworks. Um, but this is just arithmetic. All, all the conceptual part of this analysis has been done, and this is the, subtle, this is the most subtle part. 
But if you go home and think about this as you're drifting off to sleep, with probability a half, it'll make sense. And, and with the probability of half, I mean, it, sometimes it just seems so crystal clear to me that this is right. I can't imagine how anybody could miss it. And the other time, I'm totally befuddled. All right. Um,